way too much stuff. I just want to stop. Actually, that is um, that is over the whole gamut of the career there. And um, I always tell people when all that gets read off, which it does because that's my, kind of my standard of bio I send out, but it's all concurrent, a lot of it, okay? It's not like I did this and then I did this. And, you know, I have to be 110. And I have done uh, a lot of those things. But I'm one of those that if a door opens, I jump, I jump through. And so a lot of these opportunities and things have come up through the years as a, as a classroom teacher. And so I was doing this a long way. Um, so it, yeah, it's a huge long list, but it was really a lot of fun. And I've done enough of that variety of things that, um, that like, I said, it, like I said, I teach at graduate level classes at LSU, and I teach in the, the used to teach in the PhD ed tech program, which is currently being suspended because we've lost some graduate faculty. I love the budget, yay budget. And, um, the, but I do teach in the master's program for ed tech, and so I teach teachers. And even though I'm not in the classroom, I have been in the classroom now for about 13 years, I would say that all of those people, lovely, lovely teachers, keep me honest. They keep me informed, they keep me up to speed with what's going on, and um, I appreciate it and, and love them to death. I absolutely enjoy, uh, enjoy it totally. Keith Kerrville, who is, you know Keith? Am I not? You know, he, he's one of my students. So, um, anyway, uh, I'm glad to be here today. There's probably not too much that I'm really going to talk about that you may not have heard already. Because if you're interested in technology, you've probably sort of paid attention. And you've probably gone, you know, or to the Q or, or ISTE even, uh, some of the national conferences and so forth, and you've been told a lot of stuff. So, really, what I try to do in presentations like this, I'm going to talk very fast, too, because we're starting late, right? And I've got a lot of stuff to cover. But um, generally, what I'm trying to do is throw a lot of stuff out there for you so that if you can cherry pick some of the things that mean something to you and that you can take away with you and walk back and remember that, oh, yeah, I heard about that. I would like to look into that or I'd like to try some more. If I had a lot of time, which um, sometimes when I present in national conferences, I'll do like half-day workshops so that we have plenty of time to chat among each other and say, oh yeah, you use that? Well, tell us how. Come stand up and tell this group how you use it in your classroom. So I know there's a lot of those stories out there, and I'm certainly not going to stand up here telling you that I know the answers to everything and that, you know, but no, that's not true. I just spend an awful lot of time with it. And I spend an awful lot of time looking at things and researching things. Um, I also work very heavily with the LSU faculty. And I'm going to tell you this brief thing, and then we're going to get rolling. But as a classroom teacher who spent the 20 years in the classroom and then decided to go on over to higher ed, which can sometimes be, you know, the dark side, if you will. And, um, you know, it, it's a totally different culture. It's a totally different way of working and thinking and doing. And I tell those, those folks that with technology integration, so many times what's happened is that I feel like we have, you know, put the, put the computers in the classroom and said, you figure that out. You know, go ahead, go ahead. Sometimes we now mix whatever, you know, give you a lesson plan on that, you know. And then, so teachers were clamoring, I gotta train me, tell me, you know, show me. So some of that, you know, goes backwards into the into the where you got your degree or where you're working on your extra certifications or whatever. So the faculty are not necessarily at the higher ed level, not necessarily doing it all with technology exactly right either. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's we're we're stepping backwards. So now we're trying to get faculty up to speed. Because let me tell you, they're not as up to speed as you are. They are so not. So that is where I spend a lot of my time trying to get them to where they're utilizing technology in <coughs> ways with students that um, can then pass on to when you're actually in their class and you're seeing it very modeled in a way that, that you need to. So all right, as we proceed, and Patrick is my index finger back there, because I didn't bring my pointer, and I don't like standing back there and talking to your back. So anyway, so he's going to send us on through. All right, while this has a little bit of higher ed connotation here, lecture hall circa 1912. Just take a little glance. All right, lecture hall <laughs> circa 2012. Just take a little glance. 
Now, I think it's probably a one-to-one -one computing initiative with Apple. Did you not think that? Mm -hmm. Not a little fluorescent apples going on there. But do you think education might ought to change just a teeny bit in a hundred years? That's just kind of scary, isn't it? To think that over, the, over time, a lot of stuff is really entrenched and really ingrained, and it's not changing. about higher ed. We're, we're not talking about higher ed today at all. That just is the, and that looks like Campbell Auditorium at LSU. It does, no doubt. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about technology for student success and how things probably should change just a little bit in your classroom. I've never been one to promote technology as the be-all, end-all. I cannot talk about technology without talking about teaching and without talking about writing <coughs> because it's all together. Technology over time, and Diane and I talked together years ago, and we were some of the first ones in Franklin Parish to have, Diane Jenkins, to have computers in our classroom. And we struggled through trying to figure out what to do with them, how to make them work, and all that kind of stuff. But that was in the 80s. But, you know, it, that was a really long time ago. And did you realize that today in 2012 we're still talking about some of the same things? How to use technology effectively in classrooms? I tell all of my students, you know what? I'm not in the classrooms anymore. Y'all go out there, you're a whole lot younger than me, too. You're the generation. Go out there and change things. Go out there and make it different. Stir it up. Mix it up. Make it effective, but do it differently than has been done for, unfortunately, like that picture we just saw, 100 years. And it takes that initiative. It takes that drive. It takes that push, you know. But the only way things are going to change is for you to change them. <clears throat> Seriously. So, you know, I've got it. You've got it all on your shoulders. Go back home with this big burden that you now have to fix things, right? Seriously, it needs to change. But technology for student success involves several areas, and I am not actually going to present to these four areas per se. But think about it. Technology for presentation purposes, like we're doing right like this minute. But it's not just for you. It's for your students, because we're going to talk a little bit about active learning today, okay? Presentation technologies, collaboration technologies, ways that you collaborate as a professional, the way your students collaborate with one another in a classroom, and the way your students collaborate with people outside your classroom. That's involving like bringing in the experts and all that sort of stuff. Well, technology can enable that in ways that it's never been able to do before. So that's a wonderful thing. Technology for independent learning, things that may be centered, things that go off on their own, or we used to call it drill and kill, right? But they still, you know, there's still times that the use of the iPad, that's a lot of that's what's been being used on the iPad, is for individual work. They're opening apps, and they're, they're doing individual work. And then, um, of course, assessment. All of these things could be individual presentations that could take a whole day or more. To talk about because they're pulled in their pieces of what I do in, in teaching a class. They're extensive topics, but we're going to just hop around on some of them. And so keep these kind of in mind as we go through some of these tools and tips and so forth and so on and think about where they might fall as far as um, this um, for this presentation. Okay, so there's a lot of ups in technology and there's a lot of downs. Is there not? There is always going to be the bell curve of adopters. There's always going to be those that just, you get, they should have got it yesterday, they want it so bad. And they're going to do a really great job of jumping in there and figuring it out. They don't need anybody. Just give me the whatever it is and I'm going, right? Early adopters. And then the typical bell curve, you've got the biggest bunch right there in the middle, right? But okay, cool. But give me a minute, let me breathe, let me think about this. I might can do this, let me think. A little bit of trepidation, that's cool, that's fine. That's normal, right? Not everybody makes an A. Remember the belt curve thing? Not right. everybody makes an A. All right, so then you've got the, you know, the big part, and then we've got that other end down there, which some of my 
research work done with um, the Roger Diffusion Theory and all that kind of stuff about what we call the laggards. And you know what? I just hate that word. I hate that word. That's the people that just dig their heels in and say, no way. Don't come at me with that. I'm not using it. I'm not changing my ways. I'm going to teach just like I was taught 50 years ago because that's just the way we do it. So there's always going to be that bell curve, right? So there's ups to technology that those early adopters, they see everything as an up. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't matter if the technical burns out, we don't care. You know, we'll just do plan X, Y, Z, right? We're already on the ball, we're ready to do it. And some of those people, you know, are probably sitting in this room. Some of these people are here sitting there thinking about your school, going, yeah, it's what's her name down the hall. You know, she just shows me up all the time. Um, but there's always going to be that adoption level and that sort of thing. There are certainly downs to technology. I mean, for a teeny weeny thing today, I forgot my pointer. You know, I'm presenting, had to go enlist another body to click my PowerPoint through. So there's always going to be some little something that um, can actually be a very big hurdle for people that don't want to do it. Do what? No internet. No yeah, internet. Oh, and that brings me to this. A little bit further into the presentation, we are on the conference lobby wireless. All right. Bought at half a bar, I think. So if some of the things I try to bring up for you don't show, just realize we're in a closed room right here. And it's, you know, so we'll just flow with it. But there are ups and there are downs to technology. Now, okay, who has used clickers in your room? Who has a set of clickers in your room? I, there's a good portion. Almost. 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 They're coming. I don't have them. Just computers. <laughs> just computers. I just, I just okay. All right, good for you. Yours are in the mail, right? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, so polling is open. Answer this question with your clicker. You've got a one, two, three, you've got numeric buttons, and you have to press really hard. It is not a text, okay? <laughs> it is not an iPhone. It is a receiver. It's got a little curved button under your finger. Feel it press, all right? I see 16 responses, 20 responses, 23, 25, 27, 29, 30, okay? It's actually set up on a timer. Wow. When that timer goes down, the poll will close. And he will click, and then we see the results of our poll. So who likes distance learning for K-12? All right, polling closed, and that's, there we go. All right, we've got about an equal number that say yes, some that absolutely not, and some that say um, not so sure. All right, clickers, student response systems. We'll see a little few of them, a few more pictures of them in a few minutes. Every company in the world makes them now. I used to, there was just a few, now there's a bunch. These are such good tools, such good tools. The kids love them. There's ways to test. There are ways to take participation grades. Um, the list is just, it goes on and on and on about the different things that you can do. They can use them in small groups. They can quiz one another. They can think that, you know, in small little groups, they fun, uh, but they're learning the whole way through. So clickers are something that you might want to think about to put into your want list, right, of what to do. Basically, it's what you're looking at. That's the simplest type of turning technologies clicker. That's just the one that LSU has adopted across campus that's used in all the classes. And all it takes is that and a little white USB receiver that's stuck in that laptop back there. And um, you download the free turning software from the company. So it's um, really pretty easy to use. And you build your PowerPoint from inside turning. You open, you click on the little turning icon on your laptop or on your computer, and it opens PowerPoint because turning is embedded in PowerPoint. And so you create the PowerPoint slides within, um, within that turning framework. And it allows you to do all types of graphs. We've got about four interactive slides here. You can see some of the different graphs that can be made. The uses of these things are endless, uh, endless. I'm showing you the most simple way of doing anything today, just very, very quick. Okay? Um, all right, so in the description of what Keith said you want to be to talk about, he says, I want you to tie theory into practice. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> You know, I stitched in a college class all over again. I'm not sure I want to do that. But what I wanted, what I decided I wanted to do was bring out one something that I present in my classes that I think is, I just think it's the way to go. And I so wish that I had been these little people that thought this 
technological, pedagogical content knowledge. All right? So yeah, you want to call it TPA. But this, to me, is the most youthful, the most practical, the most sincere way of thinking about technology integration that's been at, put out there yet. And I teach this in almost every class I teach, regardless of what the topic is, so that everybody understands the way this works. And I'm not going to stand here and talk about this entire graph right here. But basically what you're looking at is your typical Venn diagram, which everybody understands totally. You've got technological knowledge right here, and that's the knowledge of just understanding that technology is out there and that it can have an impact, right? And then you know your content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge. You know that. That's the methods. That's the way you teach. That's what you, it's how you write your lesson plans and how you do classroom management and how you set up everything that you do during the day. But it all intersects. When I started this, I said I cannot talk about technology without talking about teaching and learning. It doesn't happen on its own. It doesn't happen as a silo. None of this works individually. If you're going to use technology in your classroom, then even though we all migrate to the cool tool, right? Those two rhyming little words you see everywhere. Oh, it's so cool. It's so awesome. I want one of those. But what does it do for your student level? If you can't look at a technology tool, a website, a program, or anything, and connect the dots with how you want to teach the content, then you don't use the tool. It's a, it's a, we don't have time for fluff, right? I know we don't, we don't have time for fluff. So this is where it all intersects. TPAC, TPAC is right there. That's how it all intersects. Yes, this can stand alone, this can stand alone, this can stand alone. But in order for it to be effective integration, it merges right there in the middle. And you never think about one without thinking about the other, right? So it's a wonderful theory. And it's one that's worthy of a read. And this is the book. Uh, it's put out by the AACTE Committee on Innovation and Technology. And it's called Okay. And that's all I'm going to say about theory. Right. Yay! <laughs> Let's play. All right. Well, why? We talked a little bit about the need for active learning, right? We talked here about presentation, collaboration, all this kind of stuff. These are some great, just, Stop and think when you're planning kind of questions. And these are put out, this is very tiny right here, but it's put out by the Partnership for 21st Century Schools. And if you are not familiar with the 21st, um, I mean the Partnership for 21st Century um, Skills, then you need to look that up on Google and find it. I, I, I don't think I put it on that list. But this, this, these are the skills that students today need. They need, now I'm not saying they don't need all the math skills and science, you know, they need all that too. But when you're talking about active learning, and you're talking about trying to help a child learn how to think, then this kind of has to be some of the things you weave in to that TPAC thing, right? You're weaving it into the way you teach, you're weaving it into what you're teaching content-wise. And you need to stop and think a minute. Are your students critical thinkers? Is there something we can do in this lesson to promote critical thinking? Is there a technology tool, a technology website? Maybe so. Maybe not. Maybe it's not about technology, right? These are still ways to do active learning, whether it's enhanced with technology or not. Problem solvers, good communicators, good collaborators, and so forth and so on. You can read that list for yourself. We find at the, at the higher ed level that the employers constantly are on campus for career days and you know, hiring people coming out of college and all that kind of stuff. And they lament, they lament over these two right here. Mm -hmm. They say they don't know how to improve. They do not know how to solve <coughs> problems. Well, y'all, if you can give it to them early, and then the next year teacher kind of does the same thing. You know, there's a little across the school thing going on where it builds. They will exit high school knowing how to do that. Will they be Einstein? No. No. You're not trying to make them into Einstein. But you're trying to make them think for themselves and be able to work together in a team and to do things collaboratively, right? Because that's what the employers out there want. They want it. 
and they plus that us. And we're like, it's another one of those backwards things. We're like, well, they didn't learn it in high school. <laughs> and high school well, they didn't learn it in high school. And the middle school teacher, well, they didn't learn it in elementary school. And I don't know what was wrong with their kindergarten teacher, but they just didn't start out right. Yeah. Okay, so we blame game all the way backwards. We do, we do. We do, we do. But, but, some point, you have to change. You have to be the agent for change. You have to be where you're going to do something that's going to happen. You're going to have to try just a little bit extra oomph to get them over, right? Okay. All right. So, you may have heard the term flipped classrooms. Who has heard the term flipped classrooms? Ooh, I need to explain it now. Okay. Flipped classrooms is really, I would consider, one of the most recent ways to teach difference. All right? Now, basically what happens is in a flipped classroom, and you can go ahead and get that little box full of stuff. There's three items there. It's very student-centered instruction. It's team-based. And what happens is, and this, when I say this, and I like this model, but believe me when I say this is not for every subject, every classroom, all day long. Okay? You got that? You're not hearing me say, this is the neatest, greatest thing ever, and I think you should go back and do this every day, every hour. No, it's not going to function like that. A flipped classroom is basically the lecture content is done by the, by the teacher. The core stuff, all right? And I'm, I'm, I still have my doubts about elementary on this, right? This is new. But content, basic content from the teacher is put into a lecture format, into a video, basically. And the flipped idea is that the students watch these at night or watch these in the evening or watch these in off times, and you spend the classroom time doing stuff doing more of the collaborative learning, pushing for that active learning, pushing for those problem-solving skills and those critical thinking skills and that kind of stuff, without doing what I'm doing right this minute, <laughs> standing up and teaching the whole time. So it is a flipped situation where it's really like homework is what you're doing while you're, is the doing part that you're doing in class, right? And the finding out the information stuff is later. And you can do that as home for homework. You know, not necessarily homework, just at some point during the day. It's radical. It's <coughs> radical. We're, I maybe can think of one class at LSU that may attempt to try this next semester. You know, it's new. It's brand new. But if you want to know about it, this is a little book put out by ISTE. It's called Flip Your Classroom. Very short little book written by Jonathan Bergman and Aaron Sams. And I just want to read real quick. It says, these are the bad reasons for flipping your classroom. Because some guy who got a book published told you to do it. So don't read the book thinking, okay, you know, they know everything. They don't. Because you think it will create a 21st century classroom, one method will not create a 21st century classroom, okay? Pedagogy should never, never, ever be a result of technology use, right? No, 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 no. It's never. Pedagogy should always drive the technology, always. The third one, because don't do it because you think you will become cutting edge. No, it doesn't necessarily use the latest of technologies. It's not that cutting edge, it's just a different way to teach. Because you think flipping your classroom exempts you from being a good teacher, teaching is much more than good content delivery. All right? It's not the lazy way out to do this. And because you think it will make your job easier, we all know that new innovative teaching methods are not necessarily easy. So I just wanted to throw this out here because one of the things that I promote with technology use with teachers is that you pay attention to what's going on out there. It does not mean that you catch every fish in the ocean. You will never, ever use everything that's out there. Never. And it can be very frustrating because there are so many fish out there, right? And choosing the right fish for your classroom for this year, for this semester, for this whatever. It's very hard. But my point here is pay attention. Pay attention to the new stuff that comes out and see if it has a place in the way that you want to teach. Classrooms. Okay? Alright, bring out the clickers. You can go ahead and punch.
punching. I think it starts the more we have. Who likes collaborative group work or project-based learning? This is all about likes. I set this up kind of like Facebook. You don't get a not like. I mean, you can say no, but you know, who likes this? It's not who uses it. Who likes it? 30 responses. All right, so the polling closed, and we've got a huge majority of yes people that do like collaborative work and project-based learning. Technology can help so much in that. And you don't have to have iPads to make it work. You don't have to have the most expensive and the latest and the greatest. There are tons of ways to do collaborative group work where the work is done and then they go off and do maybe the presentation or they use it for presentation tools and so forth and so on. Again, presentation and collaboration can be a whole separate unit. But the point today in our short amount of time we're here is think about, I like this, I like to do this, so how can I enhance that just a little bit with technology? How can I think about that TPAC part where I'm really getting across the content, I'm utilizing some technology, and it works well in the type of pedagogy that I use in my classroom? A little bit of thought process. But you will come up with something different. Something different and something innovative. Okay? All right, so a little bit about interactivity. Just briefly, I mean, we're rushing through some stuff here. I didn't ask the question that who has active boards or smart boards, which pretty much, if you were to graph out technologies across time, you would, you would see when this one was really popular or then when the next thing came along, it was really popular. And unfortunately, kind of like first grade reading series, it's like this one's going to be it, right? We hear that, you know, yeah, I mean, any of y'all teach first grade? And how many reading series have you gone through since you've been a teacher? Uh, my sister is in her 30-something years of teaching first grade, and she says, you know, I think I've got to learn how to teach them how to read. But my district doesn't think so. She doesn't teach in the state of Louisiana. But um, every time that some new tool comes along, we jump on it as educators trying to figure out, will it help? Will it be better? Will it enhance learning? That sort of thing. But no one tool is the answer. If, I, if you don't walk out of here with anything else in your brain today, that's what I'm saying to you. There's a lot of fish in the ocean, and not every one of them takes good. Not every one of them works for you. All right? But you've got smart boards, you've got Promethean boards, whatever you call them, active boards, all different kinds of things. I never got to, I mean, we, we have one at, 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 in one of the rooms at, um, LSU, but I don't teach one of the methods classes, so I really, it's always just a demo thing for me. So I don't do a whole lot of, of um, teaching with one. But again, like I told you, my students are all teachers, and they are the ones that are singing these phrases. And they are talking about them and just thinking they're wonderful. So there's a lot of really good um, ideas that have come out of this type of learning. This one happens to be a newer model where it's obviously broken into segments where you can have four people up there working together and collaborating together on the same screen. So this is one of the newer ones. Uh, the interactive the interactivity with just the simple things like the clickers, and I just put up a few pictures of the different kinds. There's tons. There's tons of them. You have to look at them in terms of cost and all kinds of stuff. A lot of uh, places, uh, especially high schools, are um, moving to using your phones for clickers. There's poll everywhere. Um, they just literally log in, or they have an app for it on their iPhone, uh, iPad, mm -hmm. and when they click on that app, then it opens, and they do the same response via the internet that you're doing via the wireless. Identical. We have a lot of students that are mixing it up. Um, you know, some of them will buy the clickers, and some of them are just, oh, I'll just have it on my iPad. I'll just do it on my phone. Whatever. So there, it, there, everything changes. Everything keeps going, but what you have to do is pay attention. You have to pay attention. Not everything's right for you. Not everything is what you want to use to teach with, and that's okay. That does not make you that other side of the bell curve. We call those laggards. Just because you don't want to do it doesn't make you want to mess up, right? Okay, I just want to point you up there and make you think, okay, I'm not one on that side of the bell curve. All right, go ahead. All right, this is something that's 
it's near and dear to my heart because, um, you know, we don't do this very well. We don't pay attention to copyright very well. So I'm just throwing this out here because this needs to be like one of those little flags that goes, doo -doo 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 -doo. think of getting students out there sharing pictures, getting pictures and spreading stuff off the internet. Right? Okay. Click once. And this is what I want you to walk away with. <coughs> Did you know, first of all, that everything you create <coughs> is copyrighted? You do not have to register it through Washington, D.C. Copyright Office. To get, that's the only way you can put a little C with a circle on it. Big kahooey. Who cares about that? It's all copyrighted. Everything you make, everything your students make, everything they design, everything they dream, everything they say. Copyrighted words, copyrighted ideas. Most people don't realize that. Everything you've ever produced is your own copyrighted materials. Now, that means there's a horrible, nobody understands it. It's just too hard. It's just too hard. Copyright's too legal. You read the copyright law and it's just boring and it's all get out. You can't figure out what it really means. And then they came out with the Teach Act and the Fair Use, and we as teachers tend to abuse fair use. Um, just because it's in the education arena doesn't make it legal for you to steal stuff and, you know, all kind of stuff. So, a very smart lawyer named Lawrence Lessig said, you know what, this is just too big a mess. Copyright just dumb. Nobody gets it. And therefore, everybody ignores it and abuses it, right? So this was born, Creative Commons. If you're not familiar with Creative Commons, this is one of those things to pay attention to. And I'm going to just briefly show you. Can you bring, can you click that? Let's see if it'll actually do our... <coughs> We, we may be speaking, we're not going to wait on it. Come on. Too long. Come on, come on, come on. Sorry. It's like you want to just. <laughs> I need another bar. Give me another bar. Come yeah, on. Okay. It might not work. Uh. Well, we just let it spin and I'll tell you what it's supposed to say. All right? These two things right here Flickr is pictures, it's photos, <coughs> it's, 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 a, it's a website where people put up stuff. Right? But there is, when you go to Flickr, and that's on your sheet, um, when you go to that, there is a place where you can search for Creative Commons photos. Now, all of these, we just kind of went, there it is, woohoo! <coughs> right? Creative Commons, they're free. In other words, the people that's hosted them there have said to you, I have given this a Creative Commons license, of which there are six or seven or eight different levels of Creative Commons licensing. And basically what it means is, is the lowest level is you can have this as long as you attribute it to me. Period. You can, you can make it into something else. You can put it in Photoshop and, you know, do whatever it is you want to. But just put a little note down there where, that it's mine. That's all it is. They just want credit where credit is due. Always flip it around. You put up something really cool on the Internet, it's, is your mindset that you want everybody to just mess around with it and do whatever? That's so cool. Or are you trying to protect it? Is it yours? So those levels of Creative Commons licensing are, are really pretty important. All right, let's flip back to the um, to the show. Where's the? You just for current. I said I don't see it up there.
attribute, uh, attribute to the right person. Um, don't sell it, right? Non-commercial use. It's allowed if you don't want to, if you don't turn around and try to sell it. So there's different levels of picking out what you would like to put as your copyright. So you can copyright your own stuff if you're posting things out there on the web. But it's great to get your students attuned to pay attention to this and see if you see any of these little symbols after something. Who else the rest of the symbols mean? Do what? What do all the rest of the symbols mean? Public domain? Uh, yeah, public Copy. domain. Uh, just a, um, yeah, public domain. I'm actually not sure what that means. That's a yen. What is that? Yen, yeah, euro, dollar. Yeah, dollar. Can't no, sell it for a yen. No, no sell it for yeah, euro, dollar, and then dollars. Right. And then let's see. I actually wrote yeah. down a few of them to go through quickly. Um, I really haven't been using my notes very much here. The past two, right? Share alike. This one is share alike. This one is attribution, which means you can copy, you can distribute, you can display, you can form it, you can make a derivative on it, as long as you give credit. That little person right there, okay? No derivative works. I think that's what this one is. And then non-commercial. So I'm really, I can't tell you exactly what all of them mean, but if you go to the creativecommons.org site, it tells you what all those are. So that's just one more thing to kind of watch out for and realize that you don't want to intentionally do something that's not, you know, what you're supposed to do. And I'm not talking about copyright police. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm talking about teaching your kids digital citizenry, right? I'm talking about you teaching your kids to pay attention, that when they borrow something off the web, they really need to pay attention of whether they can borrow that or not. That's all it is to it. That's really all, that's all the message here. Okay, let's flip. We're, okay, one more. Who likes iPad use in K-12? <laughs> All right, a little pie graph here. Okay, and so ooh, it's hard to see the colors. This is the little color grid down here, but the one is this darkest part right here. The three is this right here. And not, there's zero there. The, the It does a lot of spinning. 
it'll show, it'll, like it'll highlight small things. All of these are words. These are descriptors of those different paths, of the, and they'll zero in, okay? All right, well, I think we're not going to have time for that. That's, that's stuff now. But go to Prezi.com, check it out. Look at some of the ones that are already done, and get an idea for what this new presentation type tool is. The students would like a different thing to use besides PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. They're as sick of PowerPoint as the rest of us. They really are. So go, go with that. Okay, we're running out of time. Let's go quick. This is called a bogey. Does it look like me? Yes. <laughs> like Vokey.com is a little place where you go and you create a, a little avatar, and we're not going to listen to it, but I actually recorded something, and you just go online and you record, and there are little 60 seconds. You only get 60 seconds. But you record these little 60 seconds. They could be instructions. They could be start of the day. They could be something on your website. They embed into all different types of things. I have them in my learning management system, in my courses, in my Moodle. Um, and you click on it. <coughs> Let's say, can you scroll around? Does her eyes move on this one? No, until she's activated the mouse. Her eyes follow the mouse. It's so weird. <laughs> 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 it's so cool. It makes her look alive is what it makes. Okay. But anyway, this is supposed to be me, and I sometimes stick myself up there in the middle and give a little 30-second reminder, a 60-second reminder. You've got this coming up due. Don't forget to log in to blah, 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 blah. So anyway, bogey.com, B-O-K-I. Okay. Who's heard of Wordles? We love Wordles, do we not? Wordle.net. Wordle is a simple online program where you take a group of words, a piece of, of a paper, a website, or whatever it is, highlight all of it, go to the text box in Wordle and click paste, and then it creates that. Based on word use. The biggest word in the paper is going to show up. I mean, the most used word in the paper is going to show up the biggest, right? There's a lot of educational uses for words. It's mostly like topic introduction. And you don't have to have 40 bazillion words, right? You can have like 10. And you can arrange them all different ways. You can change the colors and all this kind of stuff. In schools, they're using them like topic introduction. They'll put that out there, and then the students have to kind of read all the words and decide and determine, thinking critically, what is it we're going to talk about today? Which one is most important? What are we probably going to talk about first? It's going to be the biggest word, right? So Wordle is really, really, really a, a fun, cool tool, very easy to use. So you want to know that word. Okay. These are some, we're not going to click, but these are some things you should be familiar with. You should be aware of they're out there. If you don't know what a blockster is, and I so wanted to show you a blockster, but Keith came in there going, five minutes, hurry. <laughs> so I'm going to hurry. Blocksters are posters. They are internet posters. And there are tons of those already out there for use as well that students love because they get a blank like a bulletin board. They can stick sticky notes. They can stick information. They can put videos up on it. They can put audio files up on it. Oh my goodness, even though it's flat on the screen, it's so much better than that three-dimensional science board, right? Are we not tired of those things or the posters? Ooh, go to electronic. Let them do an electronic poster and let them have some interactivity with it. Gloucester EDU, there's a Gloucester.com. You don't want that one. You know, that's for big people, right? That's for, you know, there's a Gloucester, but it's got some questionable stuff on it. So be sure and go to the EDU version, right? It's all the Digo. Who knows about Digo? It's a place where you can bookmark all your favorite things. You can have sticky notes. You can do all kinds of stuff to help organize all the things you like and do. Some people swear by it. I think it's the most wonderful thing since Is it like a porta portal? Sort of. Okay. Yeah, it is. It's like porta portal. It absolutely is. Khan Academy. Videos. Mm -hmm. Videos already out there to explain topics and things that your students are having trouble with. Already made. Yeah, Khan Academy. Khan Academy. Ted Ed is brand new. Notice it says beta. Who's familiar with TED videos? TED videos are also instructional videos put out there by some really good people, really important people, really famous people, really knowledgeable people. You know, things that you want to listen to, things that you want to know about. Well, now they've done the Ed version. 
tail end. So check it out. Kariki. Kariki is K-12 open curriculum. You know, like all of it's there to be shared. Lesson plans and ideas and all that kind of stuff all nicely put right in the Okay. Quick, 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 quick. Edmodo. Edmodo. Come here with Edmodo. All right. Me. Edmodo is, um, do you use Edmodo? I can see. Can you tell them what you did real quick? Uh, you use it for? My school, we made it mandatory this past year that all of us teachers use Edmodo. We used it to replace schoolnotes.com. Mm -hmm. So we started posting, um, I mean, you can tell the students anything, but we used it primarily to replace school notes. We put um, on, there's a calendar. You can post all your assignments when your test dates are coming up. Um, you know, it reminds the students of yeah. uh, coming like up. Do you do? Yeah. It's like Facebook. I mean, yeah. it looks a lot like, like Facebook. Facebook. So the kids really like it, and they're very open to posting questions mm -hmm. and answering. It's sort of, you know, it's sort of like Blackboard it's also. Uh, we started using it. It's kind of like an LMS when you can't afford an LMS. <laughs> a learning management system. You know, Blackboard or a desire learner or whatever. Ning is social community, extra normal, animated videos. Look at him going back there. You know, extra normal is, is, is really different, okay? Your kids are going to love it. You're going to look at it and go, really? It's so fun. You can do multiple languages in it, too. Like, yeah, I teach French, and they can type in French, and the characters Extra speak normal French. for sure. Oh. Animoto is also taking pictures and making videos out of them. Do your students not want to do that, like, all the time? Make a video, make a video, make a video. Use them, let them put pictures in there. Quick, 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 quick. Almost there. How in the world? Can I keep up with all of this? All right, so another one. Quick. Oh, sorry. Uh, who likes the technology professional development that you have access to? Quick, quick, quick. <coughs>
looks exactly like them. 